The first thing I wanted to, uh, to mention to you is that uh, the, in the latest issue of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, there's a review of the book that we're using in this class uh, by Thomas DiLorenzo, who's also written extensively about the Civil War and about Lincoln. Uh, he's a very perceptive economist. He really knows what he's talking about. So um, I urge you all to, to pick up a copy and look at that. Uh, they are available for sale here at the Institute. And what is the title? Um, it's the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Oh. And uh, it's volume 18, number 4, um, the last issue of 2004. And uh, it also has articles by Scott Trask on William Graham Sumner, uh, one of the most interesting Americans from the 19th century, the late 19th century intellectual. Um, and Joseph Stromberg's article on sovereignty, international law, and the triumph of Anglo-American cunning. And that article is uh, something that Joe is going to present here at our economics workshop. It's a brown bag seminar that's held in the library um, on Thursday at noon. This so Thursday. this Thursday, yeah. Thanks a lot. We're. Uh, we should get, we should get the book on the way out. We have, uh, that's a, w mostly a weekly seminar, uh, that the general public is invited to, and we cover all sorts of topics. And, uh, if you go to the Mises webpage, at the bottom of the webpage, you can sign up for announcements, uh, of things going on at the Institute for people in the local area to attend. So, um, that you can, you know, be informed about what, what's actually going on here um, on a regular, ongoing basis. Okay, in the last class, um, we were talking about inflation. We were talking about money. We were talking about prices and uh, how those things just really skyrocketed due to paper money inflation uh, on both sides, but in particular on the part of the Confederacy. Uh, which used a lot more inflation to finance itself. And we argue that that was another important contributing factor in the economic collapse uh, of the southern economy. But as we get to the end of that chapter, one of the things I didn't cover was how monetary institutions in the U.S. were changed dramatically. And now that we're getting into this, the last chapter the results or consequences of the war, um, this little section fits in quite well with that whole discussion. And what we argue, and what I think is in fact the case, is that there was a sea change in the United States in terms of its money and banking. We went from a system that was almost entirely privately run to one that was publicly controlled. Um, we went from a system where the federal government had almost virtually no role and states played the leading regulatory role to one where the federal government really was the primary regulator. Um, and then, of course, we go from one of very light regulation. In some states, you could open up a bank and accept deposits, issue notes, uh, with almost virtually no requirements placed on you by state governments, uh, and that's replaced by one of heavy regulation by the Fed, by the, not the Federal Reserve, but by the federal government. And we also go from a system that was almost entirely metal-oriented, gold and silver coins, to one that was dominated by paper in the aftermath of the uh, Civil War. Despite this heavy regulation, and it's uniform because it's done at the federal level, the American economy continued to suffer the problems of contagion. Of contagion is the primary problem in a money and banking system, whereas that the mistakes of one bank or one area of the country can infect the entire system. And these problems actually, in, in some sense, got worse in the post-Civil War period. There were a lot of panics and economic depressions 
uh, in the, after the Civil War. There was a redistribution effect um, in that the region of the South was devastated by the war, but particularly so in terms of money. Of course, all the Confederate money, all the Confederate bonds became worthless. And so Southerners were starting from ground zero, basically, whereas the Northeast, where many of the large city banks were located, and basically these banks were given preferential treatment, they really benefited uh, by essentially controlling loans, banking um, in the United States. Then we have a lot of interesting developments that occur in the post-war period. Um, The free silver movement uh, came up during this period where people were uh, attacking the gold standard, uh, wanting, you know, they basically didn't have any money to use. And gold coins were too, had too much worth attached to them. And so they wanted the free minting of silver coins. Then there's the Greenback Party, again, sort of a monetary political party uh, with the primary aim of increasing the money supply. Uh, and, of course, William Jennings Bryant uh, ran for president on the sort of the Greenback platform. And on page 77 um, in the book, it discusses the Wizard of Oz as an allegory to the problems of, to the monetary problems in the United States in the late 19th century. Um, So let's take a look at um, that allegory. The Wizard of Oz, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, was a very important book, obviously, very popular book. Um, It was something that was done in play form in theaters, uh, in the United States for years and years and years. As a matter of fact, it continues to be. I think there's, there was even a, a new version of it on Broadway a few years ago. Um, and then, of course, Walt Disney uh, made the movie The Wizard of Oz, um, one of the big first blockbuster movies uh, that continues to play year after year. Um, so it was a big thing in terms of culture in America, And it's very interesting that the author, Frank Baum, um, it's been suggested with a lot of evidence, and scholars have debated this issue back and forth, um, but if you look at a lot of the things in The Wizard of Oz, you'll find um, that there are all these little signs that he was really talking about monetary problems in the United States. First of all, The Wizard of Oz... OZ is the abbreviation for ounce, the ounce of gold, the ounce of silver coins. Um, The Emerald City, the green city, is symbolic of Washington, D.C., where the Wizard of Oz is located. The Wizard of Oz is supposed to be the president who's manipulating everything behind the scenes uh, against the population on behalf of the big city banks. The Tin Man, the Scarecrow, the Munchkins represent different groups of people, while the Cowardly Lion represents William Jennings Bryan. Um, The Tin Man is supposed to represent the industrial workers of the Northeast. The Scarecrow, let's see, the Tin Man has no brain? Brain. Yeah. No, 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 the Scarecrow has no brain. One of them has the lion has heart. no heart. Let's eliminate. Lion has no heart. The scarecrow. The tin, the tin man has no heart. Yeah. 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 See, no see, heart. The, the, the tin man is the industrial worker. They were benefiting from Republican policy, and so they didn't have a heart. Um, the farmers were the dupes in all this, so I guess they didn't have a brain. Um, that's right. Cowardly Lion, William Jennings Bryan, didn't have the guts to really take the free silver movement um, forward. Yeah, what, what, my, my friend Roy Bolger, you know, he was the tin man, was he? Uh, he was the scarecrow. No. Haley. Uh, uh, Haley. What was it? His last name was Haley. He was Irishman. He was the tin man. 
And um, and Dorothy stands for every man, just the general American uh, citizen, the average good-natured citizen who does not have a clue about the underlying causes of the problems of society. The yellow brick road, uh, of course, is the gold standard. And the ruby slippers. Remember the ruby slippers? Um, well, in the book, they weren't ruby. They were silver slippers. And when Dorothy um, clicks the, the silver slippers three times, that's supposed to be the cure-all, um, just as the free silver movement and the free coinage of silver were supposed to be the magic cures for all these problems. There's no indication, really, of whether or not how the author actually felt about all these things. He was just building all of these aspects um, of society into the equation. So he was just looking around. He was looking at this problem. He understood what it was, and he just built his imaginary story around it. What yes. What was the significance of the water that did away with the wicked witch of the east or whatever it was, or west? Well, um, yeah, the, the, the wicked witches were in the in the north and the east, right? And the, the good witch was from the south and west or something like that. But they're supposed to represent good regions and bad regions, the people who are exploiting versus the people who are getting exploited. And so this is, uh, yeah, and you really need to read the book in its original context because, of course, Disney has to, um, for purposes of making a movie, and just subtle changes along the way, the movie makers often change what's written in the book. And so it's often important to get what's in the book, um, unless the book is written after the movie. In my writings on Star Wars, for example, um, the movie was written first. And I based my analysis on um, what the, the writer had done and what was in the movie. And then somebody wrote a book about it. But that wasn't the author. It was just somebody who was filling in the script. And it turns out that a lot of the things that were in the book kind of conflicted with the movie. So read the original sources. Okay, well, in any case, um, uh, the new national banking system that replaced the largely laissez-faire system um, it's often regarded that that was somehow in the public's interest. But when you look at the facts, that's something that's hard to defend, precisely because there were all this uh, contagion effects, there was all this redistribution of wealth from some regions to others, from some groups to others. And, um, and so after a lot of analysis, the notion that it was in the public interest has become under increasing criticism. As a matter of fact, I quote three leading monetary, mainstream monetary economists in the book who studied this, the national banking system and found that if they assumed the system was based on the public interest motives to improve the economy and help everyone in society, that the system was a colossal failure. And I quote, the provision of the Acts of 1863 in 1865, that established the national banking system were designed to remedy two perceived defects of the antebellum state banking system. One was the circulation of a wide variety of state banknotes, often at a discount, which made for an inefficient payment system. The second defect was instability of note issue, marked by overissue, bank runs and failures, and periodic suspension of convertibility into specie or gold. The remedy, to remedy the first defect, the national bank issues of U.S. bond secured currency replaced state bank notes. To remedy the second defect, stringent reserve and capital requirements, oversight and regulation by the comptroller of the currency were conditions for national bank charters. Unfortunately, the remedies did not work as intended by the architects of the national banking system. Instead, the system was characterized by monetary and cyclical instability, four bank panics, frequent stock market crashes, and other financial disturbances. In other words, 
um, it never lived up to its promise. Um, and the idea that it was uh, to remedy something that was in the public interest, uh, even if that was what its intentions were, it certainly never turned out that way. And as a matter of fact, of course, as we get to the turn of the 19th century, these problems of instability uh, become not only more acute, but also more important because the economy is continuing to modernize. And so this eventually leads to calls for a central banking system um, as a way of creating even more government intervention, more government control and power over money and banking. Okay, the consequences of the war. I introduced this chapter with a quote from Ludwig von Mises, and I'd like to recite it here to you because I think it's very important. Um, I think the public's notion of war and its economic effects is decidedly wrong. I think that they've been duped by propaganda um, in a very systematic way. Economists, however, have a traditional view of war that it's destructive. And I think Mises' quote underlines this. Quote, Every unprejudiced person can naturally have no doubt that war can really cause no economic boom. War prosperity is like the prosperity that an earthquake or a plague brings. Earthquakes mean good business for construction workers, and cholera improves the business of physicians, pharmacists, and undertakers, but no one has for that reason yet sought to celebrate earthquakes and choleras as stimulators of the productive forces in the general interest. Now, Mises wrote that a long time ago. Unfortunately, what he said there is no longer the case. When we have wars, when we have earthquakes, when we have tsunamis, it won't take but one or two days later before you find some mainstream economist or business writer getting up or in print and saying, well, you know, that was really too bad for all those people who were killed, but this is really going to be good for jobs, or this is really going to be good for construction, or this is really going to stimulate things that are going on. And this is a basic economic fallacy. And we explain this fallacy in the book by going back to Frederick Bastiat, his parable of the broken window. It's a very simple parallel, but it sort of brings out what's going on here in terms of understanding the basic cause and effect of war. In the parable, some little rotten kid in the streets of Paris decides to pick up a rock and throw it through a storekeeper's front window. Smash, crash. The glass goes breaking everywhere. The kid runs away. And people start to gather to see what the commotion was about, um, to give their sympathies to the store owner. And then somebody says, yeah, you know, this is too bad, that little rotten kid, but, you know, now all of a sudden Pierre is going to have to pay um, the window the man who fixes windows, to come and fix this window. And so he's going to have more work. And then he's going to get that money, and he's going to be able to spend more money at the grocery store. And so the grocer is going to end up with more money. And so the grocer can go out and buy more clothes. And then the tailor can um, have his house painted. And then the house painter can, and then so that, you know, really... This broken window may have been unfortunate, but it's really going to stimulate the economy. And what we really need to do is find that kid so he can go around breaking windows all over Paris. But of course, when we really stop and think about it, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. You can't create prosperity through destruction. And the basic fallacy is that Instead of spending that money on the window to fix the window, he could still have the window and still spend that $300 (coughs) 
on something else. And then the money circulates throughout the economy in the same way, except we have an extra good functioning window for that store. And the same is true with war, earthquakes, and so on and so forth. It creates a lot of activity. Um, but basically, in addition to killing people um, and destroying capital, it means basically that society is going to have to do without what they would otherwise would have spent that money on. So that the end result is that war, earthquakes, tsunamis are not good for the economy in any tangible way. And then any time somebody gets up there and says, yeah, this is going to be good for the economy, just tell them they're wrong. It just, it, it, I think it's probably a good sign of how badly we've gone in terms of our economic knowledge. That what Mises said 80 years ago about nobody would dare say such a stupid thing. Now people say it all the time. Okay. Uh, Mark, yes. Did you want to make the comment that uh, currently you hear a lot of this about wars and about high tech or the development of science with the consequent application of that science in all kinds of industrial applications mm -hmm. or whatever. And, uh, and it, but it, that doesn't hold hold water either because uh, the development of that science for military purposes costs uh, a, a huge amount, incredible <coughs> amounts of, of money. Uh, that, and, and that wouldn't be the case if uh, uh, we were developing that specific science uh, for the for the so-called benefits that mm -hmm. so, uh, in the first place. Yeah, that is that is an entirely bogus argument. Sure. Um, and the the idea that science is somehow stimulated by war, um, it's just not true. We just we've never seen um, that kind of thing uh, in any really truly positive um, way. Now there are some new inventions, there are some advances that occur as a result um, of wars. Uh, for example, Claire's uh, favorite thing, um, nuclear energy um, and nuclear power was stimulated, brought online sooner than it otherwise would have been because of the war and the Cold War and all that. So. Um, it's not that nothing is produced or increased or invented or discovered, um, but the net effect is um, is that there's that it actually hurts all of these areas of technology and advancement. And the Civil War is a good case study on on this. Uh, and historians have gone back and looked at things, particularly looked at things before the war. How were things before the war? You know. For so long, historians just looked at what happened after the war and said, wow, this must be to the Civil War. This must be the result of the Civil War. Anything that was good, they said, boy, this must have been the result of the Civil War. And what they found is that, um, well, at least in, once we filter things through in the, the theoretical approach, that um, the advances, the so-called advances after the war, most of them were there before the war and there was really no advance during the war, and that growth and development was actually slower after the war. So, but you have to have uh, the theoretical approach, um, which is a tool to help pry open a better understanding of history. And let me try to explain what I mean there. For a long time, historians held a positive view of the war, that it had a positive impact. And primarily, they labeled this as the North destroying the agrarian society, the power of agrarian, slave-based, plantation-based economy, and that the U.S. became a global power, militarily, economically, and they wiped out the Indians, um, we had an industrial revolution, uh, big business started developing, the intercontinental railroads were built, and we completed our manifest destiny. So this is sort of the, the positive spin that the historians 
put on the post-war period. We argue that the war didn't do any of this and actually hurt many of these developments or slowed them up. In other words, they can't take credit for all of those positive developments. However, there are some interesting things, some of which I mentioned earlier, about the reform movements of the late 19th century, like populism. It's sort of the fly in the ointment. The general results of the war, of course, the North won. The Union was maintained. One million people were killed or wounded. Slavery was abolished in the United States. And we added three amendments to the Constitution. Of course, about slavery and about solidifying the Union. And suffrage. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in, I mean, in connection with the freedom of the slaves and the so-called guarantee that they would be able to vote, which they weren't. But not women. Not women, but... Women, women suffered, the yeah. suffrage for women was a very light thing. Only, thing. only in isolated states, like what, Wyoming? Wyoming, yeah. It was early. <laughs> we had to fight really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> George, what you don't you know what you don't realize is that women have been controlling the world <laughs> all along. They <laughs> never needed the right to vote. What they what they, what they did in the play was sister. They should have withheld their favors until they got the vote. Okay, now, this is a general audience here. We're out on the web. <laughs> Um, here, so, okay, um, there's, um, we could go into a lot about this general issue of war, about World War II and um, the post-World War, and we can go back to that if you want to in the question and answer period, that would be fine, but sticking with the Civil War itself, um, the war obviously destroyed a lot of labor and capital. As I just mentioned, one million people killed or severely wounded. Um, Maine, there was a lot of people who lost limbs and were unable to work um, after the war. A lot of capital was destroyed. Um, mostly the physical building type capital was destroyed in the south. Uh, the burning of cities and things of that nature. Uh, the bombing of cities. The destruction of housing. Um, the southern railroad system was pretty much completely depreciated by the end of the war. Uh, they used iron rails back then, and those things were just about completely worn out, and the northern system wasn't in great shape either, uh, a big part of their capital base. There was a decrease in the amount of farmland under production, and, of course, farmland was the landed capital of the United States, um, and most everything else um, in terms of machinery, housing, factories, warehouses, was depreciated uh, during the war, and businesses were disrupt, disrupted. All kinds of businesses um, failed during the war, lost their markets, lost their input suppliers, um, had to convert over to war uses and so forth. So there was a lot of depreciation of the capital stock and disruption of business and business practices. So when we look at the results of the war, emancipation was really the one clear, solid, great thing that happens. Um, and historians are not completely uncritical. Generally, things were good, according to their point of view. But there were some things that these left-wing historians had problems with. For example, the rise of the robber barons, the big city businesses, um, uh, that developed in the late 19th century and made huge fortunes and, and controlled large industries. Then there is populism, which I mentioned, uh, the development of labor unions. Uh, and then, of course, many historians are critical of Reconstruction, that Reconstruction was ineffective, that it didn't work, that it may have made matters even worse, that there was a lot of corruption um, that went on during Reconstruction. 
and that nothing was really done to help the former slave population. Theory can help us make sense of this all. If we think back to what the Republican economic agenda was, what their interests were like, who were they supporting? Well, they favored protectionism, tariffs, national money and banking, um, over small businesses, farmers, and labor that work for small business. Okay, so their agenda helped people in the Northeast in terms of banks, steel, cotton textiles, uh, people up there in big businesses, and because uh, they were protecting their business, they were gener- helping to generate all those profits. Whereas it hurt small business, it hurt labor in small business, and it hurt um, regions like the South, um, parts of the Northwest. And those were the groups that made the backbone of all of these reform movements, like populism, the Greenback Party, the Free Silver Movement. And so it's not a situation where things are inconsistent, where the historians say, well, there were some good things and there were some bad things, and we really don't know how to latch them all together. But if we realize that the Republican Party was a very dominant party in the United States, they really controlled the federal government and most state governments, their agenda was in place. They were protecting industries. They were establishing these these favorite regulations for big city banks. And so they were helping to create these large industries. They were helping to create these mega wealthy individuals at the expense of the little guy. And the little guy formed the backbone of these reform movements who were complaining. Okay, that A large number of Americans were complaining about conditions in the United States during this time. So we go back to the theory We look at the policy of the dominant party, and it all fits together fairly well for history. So the Republican agenda is not true laissez-faire. That's one of the mistakes that the historians made, is that they labeled the Republican Party agenda as laissez-faire. But it wasn't in the sense that where government was just leaving business to its own. Um, It was creating conditions where business, big business, um, almost had the right to exploit the rest of the economy by manipulating federal economic policy. So their agenda was better classified as mercantilist. Um, The Transcontinental Railroad. Here's another case where historians said, "Eh, Transcontinental Railroad, great accomplishment, amazing. We've got three lines running across the country. Um, The U.S. had to subsidize these lines um, to a fairly significant extent, but the social results of this policy was a good thing. Because if you look at the profits of the railroads, and then you add in all the satisfaction that consumers got out of the railroads, and then you consider like multiplier effects and things of that nature that Keynesian economists um, assume, then they just come up with the idea that these transcontinental railroads were a wonderful and great thing. The problem with this analysis is that it just doesn't hold up too well. In terms of railroads providing a lot of consumer satisfaction, they really didn't. They really didn't. And the reason they didn't is, I mean, consumers were um, like the idea of having the railroads, don't get me wrong. But railroads can price discriminate. They can charge you one price and you another price. They can charge one farmer um, a certain amount to bring their crops to market and another price to another farmer to bring their crops to a different market. So that if they can charge you 
a higher price because you value that service more, then you don't really have the surplus of value. You know, every time we buy something, we get more enjoyment out of it than the money we give up. That's why we do it. But if the business that we're dealing with can discriminate and they find out how much you like the product, then they raise the price. So that, like the movie theater, charges people who go at night, um, what, $8? Uh, no, but if, I'm always cheap. You go during the day. Any kind. I'm no, still he's cheap. a senior citizen. He gets well, no, yeah, price that's price discrimination and the day, night. And so there's, there's that kind of thing that's going on with railroads in a major way. So that historians have made a basically an incorrect assumption about the value of these railroads um, in order to for their calculations to come out in a positive way. Yes, Ozzy? What about the, the commerce, the Department of Commerce? Didn't they have any, and didn't they have some influence over these, these railroad barons, the, the hell with the public people, uh, Vanderbilt and all those guys? I mean... No. No, they didn't. They, did. they were just well, a, a cynical. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, especially the railroads were discriminating in the South. They were keeping it bankrupt. And uh, the, uh, finally, the federal government was the only one with enough muscle to, to control the railroads. Yeah, they, they eventually um, passed the, um, the antitrust, Sherman Antitrust Act. Mm-hmm. And when that was designed specifically because of what the railroads were supposedly doing to their customers and so on. That is the United States. Um, And, uh, you know, basically what happened uh, prior to the war is that uh, the railroad system was fairly well developed um, in the east. So that, you know, basically there was all sorts of connecting routes um, in the east out to um, Galveston area, um, I think up to Minnesota, even, and uh, and of course, that, that wasn't true in, the southeast, was it? in the southeast, yes, there was a there was an extensive railroad uh, system in the southeast. There was a a line that came from Savannah, for example, over here. Um, there was a line out of Mobile to uh, Ohio, yeah, someplace like that, and then there was another one that came up. Um, to Montgomery, I think, and then, of course, Atlanta was an intersection of several railroads. Um, I was thinking that, say, in Alabama, that, that the line ended in Columbus or something. Yes, and then that's you right. You couldn't get from there in Montgomery, and, and there was a different gauge or different width. Of, yeah, there, know, that's right. That's correct. That's and correct. There was a there was a break in the linkage between Montgomery. In Columbus or West Point, maybe. Um, and there was another railroad from Mobile to Columbus, too. So there was a pretty extensive system of transportation in the East, uh, largely because it paid. And there was, there was also public subsidies for some of these, for some of these roads. But the big deal, the big question was, who's going to build to the West? And essentially what happened after the war as a result of these subsidies was that there was three lines built. The northern line, the central line, and the southern line. So that as a result of the subsidies, we got not just an intercontinental railroad, we got three of them. And there's really not much commerce going on uh, with the West. Um, There's not much way in terms of settlement, um, and, and those kind of things, so that it was really a lot of overkill as a result of these subsidy programs. These railroads were essentially not needed, and if they were needed, 
really all you would have to have is one railroad so that, say for example, the northern one, which was the most private one and the best run, let's take that one off and take off the southern one and then build a west coast railroad system to connect the cities of south, north, northern California, Oregon, and, and, uh, and so on, um, you would save for a very long time all the resources that were had to be used in order to build those extra uh, rail lines. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be the, the central one that was built. It could be the northern one. It wouldn't really matter which one was built. Um, and think of all the timber, all the lumber, yeah. all the iron um, that was used, all the labor that was used yeah. um, during this process. We could have probably gone without the extra Western railroads for decades without ever actually needing them. And that, of course, meant that it was difficult for these railroads to make a profit because there was so much capacity vis-a-vis the demand for the services. Uh, and then there's other issues like importing um, lots of um, immigrant Chinese labor, um, the conflicts with the American Indians and the slaughter of American Indian tribes uh, that took place. Even I think somehow the, uh, the disappearance of the buffalo, I think, is even related to the building of these intercontinental railroads so that what these, what the subsidy program did was it diverted mountains of capital. And without the subsidy, um, we think that a better built, lower cost, and more timely system would have been built in its place. But didn't it depend too a lot on the, on the, on the industry and the agricultural and other, uh, things that were developing as people moved west and as the let's say the population say went more, went from Chicago to St. Louis and then from St. Louis to the next I mean uh, but and then Stanford wasn't Stanford one of the guys one of the big wheels in, in Western Railroad and he, yeah and uh, he he was he was equal to the Easterners in other words, their pressure that they put on the government for for subsidies and favoritism and all this and that. But uh, yeah, Lehman Stanford, I think, was responsible for western western coast rail lines. And you know, Ozzy, I, you know, like I said, I'm not saying that one road over the other. I'm not picking the roads. But say, for example, this is St. Louis, and we hadn't built. Um, a rail line to the west. Well, there's absolutely no reason that as farmers start using this area to grow a lot of crops or feed a lot of cattle or whatever, yeah. that a railroad line couldn't have gone out into that area. Um, so that you just need a spur line to get to the river and then you're into international markets. So, and a very similar thing happened in Texas. Uh, you know, Texas has a few rivers um that uh that were used initially by the first people to go there to grow cotton and so they would congregate around the rivers but there was a lot of area that was perfectly good for cotton growing that was unusable because of transportation costs and so they started building wood plank roads and then eventually railroads into some of these areas that weren't served so that, um, you know, you, a common notion is build it and they will come. You know, build the baseball park and the fans will come and it will be a success. That just never works. It only works um, once in a great moonshot of a time and uh, only by pure luck. As a matter of fact, if the argument is build it and they will come, that usually is a recipe for disaster. And the <laughs> sensational stars of a lot of steroids. <laughs> the, um, yeah, well, that, that thing of subsidizing railroads is still with us, isn't it? Uh, uh, it only steals the 
pay the retirement for railroad employees today? I don't know. Yes, uh, it's a category on your federal. Oh income yes, tax. yes, yes. I, I knew, there is a thing Every in there. Every time I see it, it, uh, it bothers me. <laughs> I got a friend that's uh, a vice president. They held these political types out in just about every state and uh, different companies, railroad companies, and they're out there to as lobbyists to uh, mm-hmm. deal with state legislatures and that kind of thing mm-hmm. to ensure that the benefits that there's no. That there's no negative uh, mm-hmm. legislation uh, against uh, their particular railroad, uh, and, uh, and and they, they, you know, they enjoy these huge uh, taxpayer retirements. And well, it, the railroads have been a, a mess of a business um, pretty much from the start when government started getting involved. But you know, back to Ozzy's question here, in terms of you know, would they build the railroads? Well, of course, if they're growing crops in this area, they're going to build a railroad network to serve that and. Um, you know, so you can, that a private owner can look out there at the potential, um, rewards, the potential business that's developing, that might develop, that could develop, uh, put their own money down. And sure enough, those are the type of roads that are going to be built when and where necessary. And, um, they're going to be beneficial to the local economy and to the railroad owner themselves. Yes, James. Um. I believe Tom DiLorenzo makes the point that um, in Utah, the Latter-day Saints, they built their own railroad system. How extensive was that? Do you know the details of that? I really don't know um, that about that. System, well, you know, most of these already, most of these yeah. systems were privately owned. Um, it's just that they were given various forms of subsidies and protections uh, and that's true of some of these eastern roads as well. It's just that when the federal government gets in, involved in it, it becomes an, a much bigger, more luscious types of subsidies that are being generated. I was reading a history of Wyoming. Mm-hmm. They said the railroads came through there because they could pick up coal. Right. Yeah, they couldn't like stack enough coal on the train to make the whole trip. So. Going through Wyoming, Wyoming had this lush amount of coal. They could put fuel on for crossing the Rockies. Well, that would make a lot of sense. You know, I think that the that northern route, the Great Northern, was, um, that was the for steel, wasn't it? Well, yeah. the least subsidized. I mean, the, not steel, but the products they got from Hibbing and all those places, the the ore and stuff that they got out of there. Well, yeah, the I would Great imagine northern so. Built their reputation on that. Great Lakes, you know, the, the what the, the steel going out and the, and the, and the raw materials coming in, and um, it, it depended where the railroad, I mean, the railroads were built around those, I think, were being sure. built during World War II. Well, that's that's a lot later, though. Yeah. And uh, during the gold rush days, it might take from two months to six months mm-hmm. to get from New York to California. If they went around South America, right, or if they went across the isthmus, they have them to die. Yeah, I'd say the railroad was needed. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, if, if you were if you were a Forty uh, Nine er, or if you were you were one of the California, you had a considerable population. I think. Uh, well, not not actually before the uh, before the gold rush, it, it wasn't uh, wasn't that big of a, a, a and populous of a state. There, there were and. and Come to this point too that the, it, once the need becomes substantial, the, the private money does it. There were railroads uh, and other means of conveyance uh, in the gold rush days to accommodate the needs of the gold rush uh, traffic uh, in, uh, across Nicaragua and Central America. Uh, there's uh, one railroad to Lake Nicaragua and a railroad in, in, in the isthmus of uh, in Tehuantepec, Mexico. There were all kinds of trans- uh, uh, transit points. Uh, down through there, and not only Panama too. Uh, there was a railroad there, mm-hmm. uh, and without going, going all the way around. And I don't see, and I wonder, is a question of economic theory. Uh, what's the difference in, in highways and other road kind of means of transportation and railroads? Um, well, the you know, we we subsidize the well, out, out of all these road systems and railroads and, and everything. And uh, aren't they basically a, a question of economic? The same, uh, uh, if they, once the need gets there, won't, won't they be built like 
early railroads, you had spurs going everywhere, all mm-hmm. of by private money, and, and many of them didn't do too well for those days. Uh, and many well, of them you know, the, um, the private roads and railroads uh, worked just fine. Um, the, um, now, sometimes there was boom-bust cycles in the economy where these large capital projects went under, um, just like everything else. Uh, and sometimes the government subsidies would create competition that would make the private companies um, unviable. But as a standalone matter, um, the private sector is perfectly capable of transporting, providing the necessary transport. There's no economic rationale for why transport should somehow be treated differently uh, than anything else. And, you know, getting people across the country is a is a fairly easy process and doesn't necessitate the need for railroads in any sense. It's it's only heavy materials that um, require um, railroad conveyance in the absence of water conveyance. Is this true or not? Every time they had a, a big uh, board hassle, like with, between the new, I mean, uh, the Big Eastern Railroads, and they, they uh, several authorities said that the, the railroads can transport more goods more efficiently and more and more cheaply than any other type of, of transportation, air, sea, whatever, uh, air, sea, and trucking, and so forth. Is is that not still true? I mean, that is that is true. Why do why is it that then that they don't the government does not take the the, what, what, what's in the, the, the railroads are, are, in other words, make them more efficient and rebuild a lot of them and, and so they can, they can take advantage of it and think of the jobs that would be created if they put the railroads back up to where the Where government they, does it? Uh, why doesn't the government do that? No, I don't get the government. I mean, why does, That's what why, does. why does, don't, why don't they encourage it to do Ozzie, it? I mean, the government I, should do it at all. Ozzy, you're breaking my windows. <laughs> um, well, I don't, I mean, no. it, it makes sense if, if one, uh, type is more efficient than other, well. Well, Ozzy, I, I, I it's, been, it's, um, that sounds like an engineer's report. And, you know, it's fine as far as it goes in the sense that, well, if you had to pick one system, that might be the most overall viable one because we couldn't use airplanes to carry really, really heavy stuff. And, you know, so basically you'd really prefer to have a mix of things. Uh, And I'm going to come to a solution to your problem here. (laughs) You're probably not going to like it. But um, in a market economy, consumers like choice. They don't want just one system, one size fits all. Um, I hate the concept of one size fits all because, in my case, it never yeah, does. That's not my per- I know I'm getting to your problem. Um, so you like railroads, and a lot of people love railroads. There's a great nostalgia for railroads, and there's a lot of engineering efficiencies with regard to railroads in terms of moving freight and people and all sorts of things. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. In terms of figuring out what the best mix of railroads and planes and cars, I mean, you wouldn't want to have to wait for the railroad to come and drive you to your home. Uh, You wouldn't want to have to... No, but you could have feeder lines, like monorail feeder lines for the between the smaller cities, between the small cities and the big... I want to say. Well, I understand what you're trying to say, Ozzy. Yeah. Um, and the basic problem with railroads is that they face too strong of a competition from federal highway building and things of that yeah, nature. That's true. That, that, if there was exactly no right there in Washington, and they get the federal money for that, and look at all the pollution that that arises from that. Yeah. If you had an efficient train system, I I don't know how. <laughs> Several years ago, when, it, when, we, when we traveled in Europe, they had a great train system. But the, the point of it is, is that, is that the, the car and the automobile is going to asphyxiate the United States. Well, I, I'm convinced of that. Well, I'll accept your medical opinion on that. But the important thing is that 
that I think this points out is that it's only a market economy that can figure out what mix of transportation yeah. services is the best for an economy at any one point in time, and that's going to change. Well, it's wanna, not going to. It's I not going to stay the same. That I only want railroads. There's a com- in 1965, we went all the way around uh, Santa Fe Railroad to Los Angeles uh, uh, Southern Railroad to Portland and Union Pacific back to Chicago. But the but the we had to get to Chicago from Tiffin, Ohio. I worked two se- two summers on the railroads as a section hand. And when I worked there, they they had they still had uh, uh, human uh, maintenance. And then when they but they, when they went to uh, automated maintenance, my God, I got on that train and rode from uh, 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 from Astoria, uh, Ohio to Chicago on the B and O, and I was petrified. Every every time we hit a joint, there was a lateral. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Okay, you're going off the subject, Ozzy. Well, we didn't you're, no, you're, 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 go, you're getting off the track. Okay, so just calm down. We're, yeah, we're go, no, we're going on to tariffs now. But we, we use all kinds of transportation. We okay, that's water, fine. We use uh, train and we use boat and all the way out in, in certain areas when we got off the train to see what we wanted to see. And, and there, it was a mix. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. he's got the floor. Mm. I'm setting you down. He's got the floor. Okay, I'm, all right. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm okay, not. tariffs. The Morrell Tariff of 1862. Uh, tariffs were 20% on average before the war. Um, the rest of the century, including the Civil War itself, uh, the Republican, the Republicans raised tariff rates up to about 50%. So that the tariff rates on imported goods were increased by 150% of their pre-war levels. Economists have found that 21 major industries had 100% tariff protection. And what this meant is the 50% rate was the tax that they had to pay to import it. And that tax rate was significant enough, basically, to prevent anything from being imported in 21 major industries. So people um, in those industries were completely insulated from competition from abroad. The losses to consumers under these types of tariff was tremendous. They were paying <coughs> lots of money for products that were made out of iron, textiles, machinery, and so forth. Uh, This loss to consumers, of course, translates into gains to the producers, the iron producers and the textile manufacturers in the Northeast. And this was all in the North, right? Almost entirely in the North, yes. Now, of course, there's steel, iron, excuse me, iron, in a few places in the South. Uh, but almost all of that is in the north. And um, at least prior to the war, there's very little textile manufacturing in the south that was done almost entirely in the north. Now, with those tariffs and with that protection, some of that started to leak down into the south. So that, uh, you know, Birmingham, for example, was a iron town, and uh, Richmond produced some iron, and textiles were moved down into the south as well. Um, I think there was some iron production in Tennessee and other places. So because of the protection and the fact that we couldn't get cheap uh, imports from Europe, some of it did leak back down into the south, but initially it was all beneficial to the northeast and the Midwest. Now this is going to have the effect of reducing potential income, reducing potential economic growth, and keeping the standard of living down. Um, Okay. In the book, we report on the increasing skepticism about the so-called beneficial effects of the war. And some of this gets to the question of technology, education, and science, and so on. 
Uh, George Taylor, a uh, historian, um, you know, talks about the economy growing after the war, uh, but in terms of comparing it to before the war, the economy was growing very well before the war as well. So in terms of economic growth, the, they can't find any positive effect from the war. Robert Starkey, um, another historian, looked at economic institutions before the war and after the war and found that only banks uh, were somehow different as a result. And that's something that we said was going to be different, is that banks um, were now more likely to be nationally chartered banks rather than state chartered banks, and they held more government debt because the government had issued more government debt. And that the financial power in the country was clearly in the Northeast and clearly had financial power over the South and West. And I think we quote him something to that that effect. Yes, he says, as the national banking system took shape after World War, after the war, it was apparent that human ingenuity would have had difficulty contriving a more perfect engine for class and sectional exploitation, creditors finally obtaining the upper hand as opposed to debtors, and the developed East holding the whip over the underdeveloped West and South. This tipping of the class and sectional balance of power was, in my opinion, the most momentous change over the 23-year period of 1850 to 1873. Who wrote that, Mark? Um, this is a, a historian named Robert Sharkey. Sharkey? Sharkey, as in the, the big fish with the big teeth. Um, Hunter Dupree uh, looked at the issue of technological advance. And, you know, you see, you know, things like the development of steam-powered ships and warships and things of that nature and the Gatling gun and all that kind of things that we see on TV. And you get the impression that technology uh, advanced significantly uh, during the war. But after examining the question, Dupree said that the Civil War actually hindered technology and most importantly, he found that all the institutions of technological development, the laboratories, the schools, the training grounds, the, um, the places inventor, like that. Like it, the inventors like Edison and those guys. Yeah. Tremendous impact on they, But all that existed before the war. Um, and actually, a lot of these engines of technological development development and advance and knowledge and that thing were actually stopped during the war. And he mentions a few. For example, um, if we're not at war, one of the things we use the military for is exploring and charting and all that kind of stuff. And that had to stop during the war. Uh, Robert Bruce, a uh, historian, said that the war was a distinct detriment to science. And the famous Alfred Chandler looked at transportation and business organization yet found no benefit uh, from the war. He concluded, quote, If we take a broad perspective, then it seems safe to say that of all the decades in the second half of the 19th century, the decade of the 1860s witnessed the fewest and least important changes in the organization of American transportation. Um, he also argued that, quote, the Civil War appears to have had little impact on the organization of American transportation and manufacturing, particularly if viewed from the perspective of a half a century of rapid development. In other words, he saw a lot of the rapid development and innovation uh, occurring before the war, not after the war. Um, and there's other Civil War uh, historians are in American uh, historians are uh, quoted in here. Uh, we note that the the phrase Yankee ingenuity, that Americans were somehow technologically adept and that they could solve problems with technology, uh, was something that was coined by Henry David Thoreau at least as early as 1843. So in 1843, Americans were already known to be technologically advanced. And Kenneth Sokoloff 
looked at the number of patents that were registered in the United States and found that in the pre-war period, the rate of patent registration was very significant. So they can't really find anything in Republican policy and the Civil War that contributed in a positive way. Uh, we also look at economic growth um, during, uh, before, during, and after the war. And uh, there's a table here, table 4.1, where we look at the capital stock formation in the country. And capital stock is really what drives prosperity. If your population saves and those savings get put into uh, capital or tools, then what we find is that the economy grows, income and wages increase. And in this table, basically what it shows is that the rate of capital formation increases in the United States and in the two decades prior to the Civil War, 1840 to 1860, the rate of economic capital formation, capital stock formation, is at its highest level in our history. And then in all subsequent periods, the capital stock formation declines and now we're back to a much lower level, approximately only one half the rate of capital formation now as it was in the two decades prior to the Civil War. Now this would indicate to me, and did indicate to me, that I, if I looked at income statistics, that that would ultimately be reflected um, in those income statistics. Uh, and the guy who put these together, Robert Gallman, it's kind of interesting. On page 93, he said, um, let's see, he surmised, quote, one would think that the effects of the war on improved farmland would have largely been removed by 1875. So when he was looking at this capital stock, one of the things he was looking at was improved farmland, land that had been cleared and ready for plowing. And during the war, as I said, the amount of farmland decreased because a lot of it was allowed to lay fallow and trees and bushes and stuff grew back on, onto it. Now he's saying you would have thought 10 years after the war that all that land would have been reclaimed and put back into production. But why wasn't it? Class, this is your, this is your final examination here. <laughs> the manpower was depleted. The manpower was depleted. Well, there's certainly the manpower was depleted. That's true. What about the McCormick Reaper? Didn't that come in about 1850 or something? No, like that, that was that was a little bit later. That, that was what? Yeah, but that had a tremendous impact on. But in, on ter in terms of answering this question, why would it be? According to Gallman, he would have thought, well, but ten years later they should have got all that land back into production. The population had stabilized itself. Yeah, uh, really no capital. Don't we have to know something about uh, land ownership uh, yeah. after the war? No. What about the physical laborers in the field? Was there a, a no? There wasn't really a shortage of that. As a matter of fact, there was um, this former slave population was actively looking for land of their own. It has to relate to markets. And it has to relate to customer base. Uh, um, that's getting market close. Was it, it was taxes. Yeah. Uh, remember, Republican, re Republican agenda was to, quote unquote, protect the United States, to provide protection for iron and textile industries and those sorts of things. So the prices of those goods went up. The wages in those industries went up. But for the South, that was producing a lot of cotton and, and other export goods, now there was less of a market for their particular crops. The relative price of cotton was now far below the relative price of these manufactured goods in the United States. So basically, our economy drifted away from its strength in agriculture 
and moved towards its comparative disadvantage in manufacturing iron products and textile goods. Okay. So it's protectionism, tariff taxes, essentially, which disadvantaged agriculture. So it was no longer as profitable to be in agriculture as it once was. It would be more profitable to go get a job in an iron foundry or in a textile mill. So Gallman's quizzical statement, again, is readily answered with respect to the economic tools, understanding Republican uh, economic agenda and policies. I think I'll save the um, the reconstruction of the New Deal for the last class and see if we have any questions um, about growth and policy and and uh, the Republican economic agenda at this time. Anybody have any questions or comments? Mark, I, I, I'm no student of the Civil War and, and uh, I can certainly not uh, uh, Reconstruction, but I've always had the general feeling that Reconstruction dealt more with uh, some kind of psychological Reconstruction as opposed to economic Reconstruction of the South with the military uh, occupations and that kind of thing that lasted to the period of the war that was for some time. Um, in, in, in terms of the way you think about Reconstruction today, whether it be Iraq, whether it be Europe in, after World War II or Japan or whatever, uh, South Korea, uh, was there any of that? Was there any real economic Reconstruction of the South? Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of with respect to, um, uh, you know, rebuilding infrastructure and things of that nature. Um, uh, there was uh, very little effort in, in that regard. It was, as far as I can tell, it was a federal army occupation, um, and it was designed to basically occupy the South until Southerners in particular states were willing to concede, um, sign pledges, um, you know, that sort of thing, uh, to... Uh, to get back in the Union. They weren't going to be allowed out of the Union, but to get back in the Union, um, they were going to have to be politically reconstructed. Everybody, or many large categories of people were disenfranchised and, and then uh, re-enfranchised uh, right. uh, by different categories. Uh, right. You would be re- re-enfranchised um, well, you'd be, if, if you were a uh, uh, former slave, of course, you weren't guilty of anything. Um, and, but other people who were involved in the Confederate government or even in the state governments of the Confederacy, uh, those people had to basically either weren't allowed to vote or if they were, they had to sign pledges. If you were a soldier, if you were, if you held any, any public office. Right. Uh, regarding your, Clara's comment and yours on taxes, the tariffs, I'm sure Ward Allen told me as a young man he worked for a scrap dealer in a town outside of Birmingham who had to ship his scrap to fill up to Pittsburgh because of the railroad tariffs that wouldn't allow him to ship it 10 miles to Birmingham. Really? So he'd, he'd be a young man in 1930, I guess. Mm-hmm. So the, they stayed around for a long time in discriminatory. That's an amazingly Stupid policy. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, it's you know every every, every time you um, you think they can't become any more idiotic, you find examples that they're perfectly capable of coming up with some of the most bizarre things in the world. Was the cotton gin invented right after the Civil War during Reconstruction? No, gin. the cotton gin was invented earlier. Um, that would diminish the need for slave labor? No, no, the, the cotton, the cotton gin was, um, 
in some sense, the piece of technology that's behind a lot of this stuff, that was invented um, at the end of the previous century. Yeah, so and so that was that was already around, and it was being developed and made uh, more productive over time. And the ability to gin that cotton and get the seeds out mechanically um, reduced the cost of crude cotton available for manufacturing textile goods. And so... How did they do it before the gin? By hand? By hand. Yeah, they okay, and, so that would and combs. Yeah. Well, we and, do it. The, the Yorkers did it in England and, and, and the Europeans. Well, the, Europe, the, um, the Indians... Um, processed it by hand. Um, but that that technique um, basically pushed cotton into the primary um, material for making textiles, mm-hmm. uh, giving it a clear comparative advantage, and that increased its price, the demand for it increased its price, and the production of cotton um, Increased dramatically throughout that, the entire, uh, certainly the entire pre-war period. And I believe it, it continued to increase afterwards because they were still pushing out cotton production into the West. And of course filling in all the, um, the open places in the East. Mark, when was the, uh, legislation that uh, made, uh, uh interstate, uh, on interstate commerce, uh, when it prohibited uh, that kind of thing. The interstate commerce. You know, they prevented uh, these tariffs between among the states. Oh, the clause itself is in the Constitution. Uh, yeah. So that that's in there. Um, that's in there from the very beginning. Well, then how, how are these, uh, uh, it's been said, I think, in this class that 70 or 80 percent of the income to the national government uh, was, was from uh, taxation or tariffs on the southern cotton, or southern products. Okay, um, well, no, that's a little indirect. The, the Constitution prohibits um, states from charging tariffs on one another's goods. It also pre- prevents the federal government from taxing exports. But it still can tax imports. And so the federal government was taxing uh, the imports into the United States. This is largely the iron and textile goods that I've been referring to. Manufactured products, machinery, uh, those kind of things. So that <clears throat> the Southerners aren't paying the tax on the cotton. They're selling the cotton, but then when they buy the iron goods and the textile goods and the finished products, they have to pay the tariff that's built into the price of all those products. And it doesn't matter if it's an imported good that's had to raise its price or a domestically produced good that gets to raise its price that Southerners and many people who weren't directly involved in those protected industries pay the tariffs indirectly. You certainly don't think of the people in a iron mill in, um, in the North that's benefiting from the tariff as having to pay the tariff, even though some of the products that they buy may have the tariff worked into it. So the Southerners... Um, are considered to be basically, at this time, paying uh, the bulk of the cost of the tariff and therefore paying the bulk of the cost of the government. When you said the tariff, the uh, products were taxed, I mean, the tariffs on them were 150%. Why didn't that choke off everything? For God's sake, you, if, you, if you tax it three times what it's worth, I mean... Well, actually, Ozzy... The um, the tariffs went from an average of 20 percent to 50 percent, okay, and that was enough to choke off all virtually all imports 
In 21. That's, that's actually 50% of the value of the product. That's right. The tariff. That's right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, that's not unheard of. There's a lot of countries that have had uh, tariff rates of, of that same sort and still do today. Um, you know, a lot of small, poor small countries will put heavy tariffs on certain items that they know are going to be imported um, and then know people are going to have to pay a huge tariff um, to get them in there because that's their stream of revenue. And, um, and so that's been a common ploy of, of governments. This is not, unfortunately, this is not all that unusual um, for governments to want to put high tariffs on their economies, even though it's on net uh, detrimental. Yeah. to the economy. Right. It's, yeah. it's going to benefit somebody. So that's the key thing is that um, the, the overall equation here is that the government benefits by getting tariff revenues. The producers in protected industries benefit from that protection from competition. But even if you combine the dollar values of those two benefits, the loss to consumers is still much greater because they have to pay more, they get less of it, and they have a restricted number of products to choose from. And um, so the overall result for an economy is that tariffs are going to hurt the economy, especially high tariffs. Uh, It may not be the worst way in the world to pay for government, but if you're using it for protective purposes, you're really harming the, the uh, general interest um, of the economy. And there's a lot of misconceptions about this, even on the part of economists, I should say, because, because we had high tariffs in the United States and because we were so prosperous in the late 19th century, a lot of people have said tariffs caused the prosperity. But that's not really the case. I mean, the case is that the United States was a v- extremely free economy, basically on the gold standard, despite the monetary problems. Uh, we had increasing amounts of labor coming in from Europe and around yeah. the world. We had um, a huge amount of land that was available, and we had capital pouring in from around the world because the U.S. had the freest capital markets and the lowest taxes. That's why we were so... Uh, prosperous uh, during that whole time. And plus, plus we, we didn't have any wars. So we had all the right ingredients for that pretty good. Was brought on in Sherman Antitrust Act or the Antitrust Movement? Uh, well, that's, that's a very good, that's a very important issue. The antitrust um, movement, as I said, is tied up with the railroads. And it's tied up with the farmers. And the interest of the farmers getting their products to market and feel that they were being charged too high of a price and that the railroads weren't charging competitive prices. Well, I mean, this is, I think, just another example of how the Republican Party agenda um, had sort of put things in the direction of the, the big guy, the, like the railroads and the banks, to the disfavor of the small guy, the small farmer and the worker. And so as a result, there's a movement, a reform movement develops amongst the farmers um, to somehow put controls on uh, industries like the railroads. And that's where it was directed at, is against uh, big business, like the railroads and uh, Rockefeller's oil company, um, the mining and uh, industries uh, that were making these huge profits off of the Republican agenda. Um, you know, so that's basically um, what the target was. Well, when, is that the same when, situation that existed in the, right after the First World War into the uh, prosperity and then the recession of the 20, early 20s? Yeah, the Republicans were still in control. Um, there was a downturn in tariffs um, 
when uh, Wilson, when the Democrats finally got back in, and um, and so there was, a, uh, I think, a movement towards free trade. Tariff levels, rate levels that I've seen in textbooks indicate that the tariffs went down um, during that time period, only to be, of course, the Smoot-Hawley tariff comes back in uh, with the beginning of the Great Depression, um, and world trade re-collapses, basically. We had just get, gotten on to a relatively free system, and then it just collapsed back on itself. Yes, I mean they were definitely they were definitely um, one of our competitors in a lot of these markets, and um, so uh, yeah, obviously the the uh, the sentiments from World War One, combining with the fact that we were competitors, and that if we were going to be keeping anybody out, it would be uh, the Germans in large part, who were out competing us in in some major industries. Okay, we're out of time once again. We've got one more class coming up next week. That was excellent.